In this fourth presentation, we are going to talk about the polarization switching using the PFM. So the big difference between the ferroelectric materials and the general piezoelectric materials is that in ferroelectric, polarization can be manipulated by the electric field. So if you look at the schematics of the polarization oriented downward, we can actually use the scanning probe microscopy tip to orient it upward. And there are quite a lot of reasons why it can be useful. So one example that have uh, fascinated the scientific and uh, industrial community for quite a while is the use of ferroelectrics as the recording medium. So imagine that you have a hard disk, but instead of the ferromagnet, it is covered by the ferroelectric layer. You are going to use the scanning probe microscopy tip to switch the polarization up or down essentially creating the recording where the polarization is the used to contain the information. It turns out that initial result in this uh, technology obtained about uh, 20 years ago were extremely promising. So it is possible to create the ferroelectric domains of the order of several nanometers corresponding to extremely high information density. Another example when the switching ferroelectric domain is useful is so-called ferroelectric lithography or using polarization manipulation to create nanostructures. And I will show a few examples of the ferroelectric lithography later in this presentation. Furthermore, studying polarization switching, we can get a very deep insight in the physics of polarization switching. So we can explore phenomena such as domain wall uh, nucleation or domain wall motion and that tells us something about the physics of the ferroelectric material. So can, how can we use PFM in order to perform the studies? The idea here is very simple. Imagine that we just slide the PFM tip along the surface, so the classical rastering, and while we move the tip, we switch the bias on the probe using the pulse generator. So when the bias is negative, the domains are oriented upward. When the bias is positive, domains would be oriented downward. So almost like a recording magnetic head in the hard drives or players. And of course, this approach was invented quite a while ago. And basically everyone who starts to do the PFM starts with the writing the simple shape. So for example, this is the standard pattern of the domains in the form of squares of the decreasing size that everybody uses the way to test whether your material is ferroelectric or not. Of course, you can write a more complex shape. So this is the example of the uh, nanoscale amplifier blueprint. And uh, obviously the background is chosen to be blue in order to, because it's a blueprint. Uh, this is an example of more com uh, complex pattern when we use the PFM to write Department of Energy or NL, or even write the logo of the Department of Energy on the ferroelectric material using a custom design lithography system. Uh, sometimes we can actually explore the stability of the domain after writing, and this is the example of the domains of barium titanate, which are not stable and really want to revert back. So we start to get some insight in the domain wall velocity and interactions between the domain walls and the lattice defects. So these studies have been pursued by multiple groups for quite a while. So this is the beautiful example of work coming from Professor Kitamura work when they created the domains in the lithium niobate. So you can see the hexagonal domain or the elongated domain. And uh, they observed this domain dynamics over time. And you can notice that the hexagonal domain starts to shrink while generally maintaining the sort of roundish hexagonal shape, whereas the elongated domain shrinks only in uh, this direction. So basically, uh, by observing this domain relaxation, Kitamura and Terabe concluded that the domain wall shrinkage is controlled by these uh, angles on the domain wall. So it is the vortices that actually control the relaxation. And they have further explored the effect of the 
spinning side. So if you irradiate the surface of the material by the helium atoms, you create a lot of damage and uh, this damage will pin the domain walls and preclude domain from shrinking. This is another example of the domain wall relaxation kinetic studies by a group of Zhu and Kan. So they created the multiple domains, also in lithium niobate, and they systematically explore the domain size over time. And you can see that the domain relaxation kinetics have a well-defined uh, characteristic shape. So your domain radius stays almost constant for quite some time, and then all of a sudden the domain starts to very rapidly disappear. If you explore the kinetics as the function of the initial domain radius, you will see that a uh, larger domain stay longer, smaller domains disappear much faster, and based on this observation they concluded that the relaxation has essentially two stages. The slow stage is the shrinking of the penetrating domain, and the fast stage is the vertical shrinkage when the domain loses the connection with the bottom electrode and then start to very rapidly retract upward. And uh, the retention time of the domain is uh, dependent on the initial size and thickness. And that's kind of important because uh, this is relevant to the application of these materials for the information storage. Uh, similar studies were performed in uh, North Carolina State University for domain growth kinetics. So in this case, Gruverman and colleagues have uh, explored the domain size as a function of bias pulse. So you can see here the series of the domains when we apply minus 20, minus 25, minus 30, all the way to minus 70 volts to the tip. And you can see that the higher is the voltage is, the larger is the domain. And similarly, we can study the size of the domain as a function of time. So for example, here ranging from the 10 milliseconds to the 90 millisecond. If you do these measurements in the sufficient uh, amounts, we can get the uh, growth curves which show the domain radius as a function of the pulse duration. So this is the domain size versus uh, time for 20 volts, 50 volts, 100 volts. And what's interesting is that if we can superimpose all these curves on each other and show that the domain growth kinetics can be described by the universal scaling curve. So the domain size as a function of voltage and time is a universal function of time divided by voltage. So it's very well defined behavior. Interestingly, this uh, universal growth curve is uh, uh, roughly logarithmic. Uh, it turns out that domain growth is strongly affected by the defects in the system, and uh, Patricia Parush group in Geneva have done probably the most systematic studies of how the domain wall kinetics is affected by the, um, by the disorder in the material and uh, they directly correlated the effect of the disorder strength on the kinetics and the manifestation of the disorder at the roughness of the ferroelectric domain wall. And uh, these publications, which by now are classical, contain the detailed information on uh, this phenomena. In several cases, uh, for example, Agronian group explored the domain wall relaxation and growth in the presence of the macroscopic defects and have shown that the defects, as expected, can inhibit the domain growth and uh, basically both the effects of the microscopic and the macroscopic defects of the domain wall propagation can be analyzed in this manner. Now, uh, I need to bring forward one note of caution. So in some of the previous lectures I mentioned that when the PFM measurements are performed in air, we should always be concerned about the potential formation of the liquid droplet on the junction between the tip and the sample surface. So this is a picture from the Langmuir paper in 2005, which shows how this domain wall droplet evolves at the function of the humidity. So if it is 40% humidity, the droplet is almost invisible. If it is 60% humidity, the droplet is actually about uh, 400 nanometers, and uh, if the humidity is 
the droplet is about 2 microns. Notice that in most lab spaces the humidity is not very precisely controlled. So if you're doing measurements in Tennessee in summer without air condition, you would be in about this regime. If you are doing the measurement somewhere in the Nevada, uh, then the droplet would be about this size. So we cannot expect the result of the measurements done under these conditions and this condition to be the same. Now, uh, does it tell us anything about the alternative models for the observed domain dynamics? And the answer is yes. So for example, this is the work from Lloyd Whitman group when they explored the thiol diffusion on the material surface as a function of time. So this is just an example of the deep pen lithography. This is the curve that we got for the domain wall growth as a function of pulse duration. So it turns out if we just overlap these two curves, they show remarkably similar behavior. So this is not a very rigorous comparison, but one thing for sure is that the dynamics of the surface charges can provide an alternative explanation for the observed domain wall kinetic studies. And I think this area is uh, still waiting for systematic studies in vacuum environment and the controlled atmosphere is a function of the environmental stimuli and so on and so forth. What else can this absorb water do? And uh, let me give you an example of so-called uh, formation of the bubble domains that can be directly traced to the effect of the surface ionic charges and water layers. So this is example of the domain switched on the surface of the lead titanate. And even though the domain was switched by the positive tip bias, it actually formed the large negative domain. You can see it here on the phase image, but for some reason, in the middle of the domain, in the area where the tip was, the polarization switched back to positive. And the question is, how did it happen? And it turns out that we can very easily explain this effect if we postulate the propagation of the surface charges on the material surface. So imagine that initially we had a tip which is positively biased. This tip causes the polarization below the tip to switch negatively. So far, so good. However, if we keep the tip on the surface for extended amount of time, the tip will start to inject positive charges that will spread on the surface far outside of the initial contact area. So here the dotted circles actually show this injected positive charges. As the result, the electric field is also spreading and also our domain start to become much larger. However, once we turn off the tip bias, the charges in the tip disappear instantly. So this is metal. The charges in the metal respond instantly to bias. However, the injected charges on the surface, which are ionic in nature, they remain for quite a while. And what's interesting is that now, relative to the injected charges, the tip is effectively charges negatively. And this effective negative charge will result in the backswitching and formation of these bubble domains. So it turns out that once this phenomenon was recognized, the formation of these bubble domains and the ionic effects start to be much more visible. And I will show several more examples of this behavior in the further part of the presentation. Now, if we switch domains, can we somehow translate the ferroelectric polarization into the physical structures? And the answer is yes, it is uh, very possible. So for example, since the early days of ferroelectricity, it has been known that the etching rate of ferroelectric material is dependent on the domain orientation. So if we take a piece of barium titanate, which has domains and put it in the hydrochloric acid, the positive domain will etch at a different rate than the negative domains. And if we take the sample out, we will see the difference in the etching rate as the very beautiful topography. So guess what? If we uh, take the ferroelectric material and write ferroelectric domains by the tip and then etch the material, we can create the topographic pattern that follows the domain structure. And this is the example of the several configuration for the photonic crystals 
and for the diffraction gratings that were created by the Kitamura group using this approach. And it turns out that after a little bit of experimentation, they were able to find the etching conditions that produces reasonably flat surfaces for a pretty large etching depth. Another way to fabricate the structures based on the ferroelectric material is so-called the ferroelectric lithography. So this uh, approach is based on the fact that perovskite titanates like strontium titanate or titanium dioxide are very often photoactive. So they're used for photocatalyst, photoreduction of metals, water, photodissociation, and so on and so forth. So question is, if we take uh, titanate and uh, add some polarization, would the polarization affect the surface electrochemical activity? And the answer is it would. Imagine that we have a material with uh, the following band structure. So we have a flat bands in the bulk and we have a slight downward band bending next to the surface. Now imagine that this material has a negative polarization. So the polarization vector goes inside. As the result, the bound polarization charge is negative and the bands would bend upward in order to compensate for this polarization charge. So we accumulate holes in the vicinity of the surface. Obviously, if the polarization goes in the opposite direction, then the band bending would be downward because in this case, electrons should go to the surface in order to compensate for the polarization charge. Now, imagine that we shine light on such surface. So the light goes in the material. If the uh, energy of the photon is larger than the band gap, we create electron hole pair. In this particular case, the electron goes to the surface in order to compensate the uh, polarization bound charge. The hole goes in the side in, inside the material. And uh, if the experiment is done in ambient or in the absence of any electrochemically active medium, we'll just go to the flat band condition, much like a classical solar cell. However, if the experiment is done in the presence of the electrochemically active ion, for example, the silver cation in this case, the electron that goes to the surface will actually induce the chemical process and uh, form the metallic silver. Uh, at the same time, if we do the same type of experiment with the polarization going downward, in this case, the electron will go inside the material and the hole will go to the surface. So we are no longer going to have reduction in this case. However, we can have an oxidation. So for example, if we do it in the aqueous solution of lead salts, we will precipitate the lead O2. So our lead 2 plus would be oxidized into lead 4 plus, which forms the poorly soluble lead uh, O2. Uh, notice that this model is pretty simplistic and for example we don't say anything about the destiny of the electron that goes inside the material. It actually will have to recombine either with the hole that is generated on the domain of opposite polarity or it will have to go to the bottom electrode somewhere. But this is a little bit more complex mechanism and uh, we are not going to uh, discuss it here. So short summary is that the reduction happens on the positive domains, oxidation happens on the negative. And this is the example of how it works. So this is a surface topography of the barium titanate ceramics. This is a piezo response signal, so you have a beautiful domain pattern. We can take this material, put it in the solution of silver nitrite, shine the light on it, and lo and behold, you can see that silver deposited on some domains but it didn't deposit on some other domain. So you see the clear correspondence between the piezo response pattern and the silver deposition pattern. What's interesting is that this process can be repeated many times. So we can remove silver just by mechanical uh, stimulus, put the sample in the palladium salt, shine the light on it, and now we have a palladium deposited on the same domains. And you can see that the silver deposition pattern and palladium deposition pattern are exactly the same. 
So in principle, it is possible to successively deposit uh, several met metals. The exact uh, morphology of the metal particles will be dependent, obviously, of metal and deposition conditions and can be very beautiful. It can be the nanoparticles for silver, it can be buyers for palladium, it can be the large uh, triangle of hexagonal particles for gold, and so on. Turns out that we can further use this approach to create a more, con a more complex pattern. So we can combine this domain-specific photo deposition and the PFM writing of the domain patterns in order to create the ferroelectric lithography. And this is what I mean. So this is a topography of the PZT film, and this is a PFM image of the PZT film. So you can see that it looks like noise, but in fact it's not. It is just very small domains. I can prepare my deposition field by switching the polarization in one direction. I can use the PFM in order to write the lines of different thicknesses. And uh, then I can deposit silver. And as you can see, that silver deposited exactly on the regions where I created my PFM written lines. And of course, in this case, this is uh, freestanding, but I can also form the pattern of the domain between two macroscopically deposited gold electrodes, and I can create a chain of silver nanoparticles that connect two gold electrodes. This approach, of course, is uh, fairly non-optimized, so we have a lot of silver deposition on the gold electrodes, but as you can see, we don't see much uh, silver deposited between them. So in some sense, we created the pattern exactly where we wanted it to be. You can find the details of these experiments and the discussion of the mechanism of the ferroelectric lithography in the following several publications. So the general introduction of this approach and the discussion of the application of PFM lithography for multi-component nanostructures. And it turns out that we can also use the electron beam, not only the PFM tip, in order to create the domain patterns. Now, what else? So it turns out that ferroelectric switching is simple only in case when we assume that polarization switches between up and down states. However, there are a lot of very interesting materials when the polarization can exist as multiple degenerate cases. And this is the example of the polarization switching in the rhombohedral material. Imagine that we start with this polarization orientation shown by the black arrow. So polarization goes in the 1 minus 1 minus 1 orientation. In this case, we can switch polarization by electric field in four possible orientations. So we can either switch it by 71 degrees when the in-plane component remains the same and only out-of-plane component flips, or we can switch it by 180 degrees, so from this orientation into this blue orientation, or we can switch it into the red or green orientation when we switch the vertical component and one of the in-plane component. So formally, from the point of view of thermodynamics, these four states are thermodynamically equivalent. They have the same energy. However, from the application point of view, they would be very different because we change the strain state of the material. And uh, what makes this switching particularly important is that control of the 180 degree switching and non 180 degree switching potentially allows control of strain and magnetization or the parameters so if we deal with the multiferroic the different polarization orientation will also correspond to the different magnetization states and it also potentially allows for creation of the domain walls of the required character. And in the light of all the recent studies of the domain wall electronics, that can be very, very important. So the question is, can we use the PFM in order to control this ferroelastic switching? So create the yellow domains or red domains or blue domains or green domains on the demand. And at the first state, a uh, first glance, this should be not possible because, again, the energy we can transfer to the system is roughly constant. However, it turns out that uh, it is possible to use the PFM 
to switch in the predefined non 180 degree state. And the reason how we found that out was from the observation of the PFM spectroscopy of the pre existing domain walls. We are going to talk about the mechanism of the PFM spectroscopy in the uh, next lecture, but for the time being, I will just say that this is a method that allows us to measure the local hysteresis loops on the material. And in this case, we just measured the hysteresis loop on a very dense grid, so 64 by 64 pixels, over the pre-existing domain walls in the bismuth ferrite. And what we observed is that for negative nucleation bias, sort of corresponding to this point of the hysteresis loop, the domains were essentially the same. And for the positive nucleation bias, we observed that some of the domain walls have depressions. So clearly domain wall somehow affected the switching of the out of plane PFM component. How did that happen? So what we did was to explore with the Professor Longquin Chen group at Penn State the mechanism behind the polarization switching using the phase field modeling. And this is the example of the polarization and the electric field in the material before and immediately after polarization switching. So notice that the difference between these uh, two images is that here we have four and a half volts and here we have four and a six volts applied to the tip. So before switching, we distort our polarization field a little bit. So polarization is minus one here, minus 0.2 here. And our electric field is basically the negative field of the tip. At the same time, once we switch the domain, so our polarization is now minus one in the blue region and plus one in the red region. So we have a well-defined ferroelectric domain. And the structure of the electric field has a very clear, uh, clear shape corresponding to the presence of the charges on the tip edge. So we have negative charge of the tip. You see the negative field here, but we also have the negative charges on the end of the domain and they create this very well visible dipolar field here. So what's interesting is that the domain is needle-like despite the fact that polarization is oriented in one one direction. However, if we plot the in-plane behavior of polarization, we start to see that the evolution of the domain structure is much more complicated. If we explore the switching in the material surface when there is no domain wall, we basically form this rosette. This is just the radial component of the electric field and therefore polarization. Then we nucleate the 180 degree domain. So this is central core is when the domain has nucleated. But then all of a sudden we nucleate the central domain and we can nucleate two domain lobes. So here we switch only one polarization component. And here we switch two polarization components. We switch the vertical component and we switch in-plane component. And uh, if we keep increasing the bias, we start to have this kind of flower pattern. And the reason why this happens is because the field is normal to the sample surface only directly below the tip. If we go in the red direction, we start to have the in-plane component of the tip field. And this component can also switch polarization. Interestingly, if we do the switching at the domain wall, we start to see that domain walls start to bend in response of the tip field. So the domain wall bending is an effective mechanism for compensation of the uh, tip field. And the switching is actually easier. So in this case, nucleation starts earlier. And uh, rather than forming this half flower, we form only one petal. And instead of the second petal, we start to bend the pre-existing wall. So this modeling was very useful because it basically explained why the switching at the domain wall happens differently from the switching in the bulk. But it also allowed us to propose a way to control the non-180 degree switching. And the way to do it is by breaking the symmetry by the motion of the tip. So the idea is very simple. Imagine that we apply bias in this location and we create this pattern of the 180 degree switched domain. 
and uh, these petals formed by the uh, 109 degree switch domain. If we start to move our tip along the surface in this direction, then the domain in the wake of the tip motion would be uh, erased and only the pink domain remains. If we move the tip in this direction, then only the green domain will remain. And finally, if we move the tip in this direction, then only the purple domain will re remain. Does it work? And the answer it does. If we start to switch polarization in the bismuth ferrite, moving the tip in the different direction, we start to create the differently oriented domain pattern. We can orient them in this direction, we can orient them in this direction, or we can orient them in this direction. Therefore, we can control the in-plane polarization, which is would be a symmetry forbidden process for a static tip, and this opens the pathway to control the strain and magnetization of the And of course, we can get some fun doing that so for example we can create the star pattern by changing our polarization direction we can create a diamond pattern we can create a zigzag and we can even create the ferroelectric vortex state so ferroelectric vortex was something that people were very interested in because of the anomalous properties existing at the vortex cores and it turns out that if we can control in plane ferroelectric domains then we can create vortex state, and this is the example of uh, formation of the ferroelectric vortex. So we can prove that this vortex would be stable, and in fact they are stable experimentally using the modeling. So if we define the phase field model when the domain patterns are predefined at the edges of the experimental region, and then we let polarization relax in the center, it will actually form this vortex state and it will remain stable for quite a significant amount of time. So vortexes are stable in theory and they can be formed and they are stable in practice. So these results are discussed in this series of papers. So starting from uh, Nina Balki paper in 2009, showing the deterministic control of ferroelastic switching and uh, Rama's paper on exploring topological defects in bismuth ferrite and uh, another paper exploring the electric conductivity in the ferroelectric vortex core. So basically uh, here we have shown that the central part of this vortex forms essentially a conductive channel through the material. And uh, additional studies of the fields in the vortex are reported in the paper by uh, Ben Winchester and Lang Chen. What else? Are there any other interesting examples of physics appearing during the ferroelectric switching in PFM? And the answer is yes. So a few years ago, one of my colleagues in Oak Ridge was exploring the polarization switching in the lithium nitrate, so the same very famous material. And under certain conditions, for example, 30 volts, he observed that the domain switching, if we apply the sequence of the pulses while we move the tip, the domain switching gives a pretty trivial result. It just forms the chain of the domains of equal size. However, he experimented with the spacing between the centers of the domain, and he started to observe very unusual results. So for example, when the spacing between the domains is 150 nanometers, you can see that the first three domains are big and then the domains become much smaller. And when the spacing between the domains is 100 nanometers, the only the first domain is big and all the other domains are smaller. And uh, if you start to work with the uh, intermediate uh, spacings, even for example, even smaller ones, we have big domain, smaller domain, two big domain, small domain, then domain doesn't even form. So it's interesting. If you play with the voltages, the behavior also changes. So for example, for 160 nanometer spacing and 40 volts, you have big domain, small domain, big domain, small domain, and then three normal domains. For different spacing, we can have a periodicity, big, small, big, small. And uh, then we start to see a more complex regimes when the number of the domains is uh, almost chaotic. So for example, here, we have big domain, small domain, medium domain, big domain. 
medium domain, big domain, small domain, four medium domains, big domain. It's a really beautiful pattern, and uh, it's really not how the ferroelectric should switch. So what's going on? And uh, what we believe is going on in this case is the manifestation of the screening charge effects. So what happens is that if we switch polarization, we need to release the charges that were initially screening the polarization. So if the domain was upwards, uh, it was screened on the surface by the negative ionic charges. Once we switch the domain, these charges need to go outside of the initial switching area. And uh, if they do that, and if they don't go to the tip or don't evaporate, they will suppress the polarization switching in this adjacent area. This is almost like Le Chatelier effect. So this suppression of the switching in the vicinity of already switched domain is the mechanism that results in this intermittent chaotic behavior. Uh, we have analyzed this behavior in detail using the appropriate numerical model, and it turns out that we can create a diagram for positive possible switching behaviors that show the regimes of the no switching if our voltage is not enough, a regime of the isolated domains if the domains are apart from each other, they just don't care. But there is a regime where we start to observe the intermittent and chaotic behavior. And it turns out that this phase diagram is very close to the experimentally observed behaviors. So experimentally, if we map this whole behavior, the function of distance between the domain centers and the tip bias, we see the regime of no switching, single domain switching, merging, and the regime of this anomalous dynamics. And if we roughly compare this diagram to this diagram, just on the level of the orders of magnitude, we get the estimate for the critical field uh, necessary to induce switching, which is about one world per nanometer which is very close to what is called Pyrrhus field in the material, which is about 0.4 to 0.8 volts per nanometers. And this Pyrrhus field is basically just the height of the potential barrier between the unit cells. Furthermore, we get the estimate for the water thickness, which is roughly proportional to the tip radius. So going to this water effects that I mentioned for quite a while. It turns out that these behaviors are further reflected in the domain shape and stability. Imagine the experiment when we apply the waveform to the tip that goes like a triangle shown here, but then we interrupt it at certain time domains and we take a picture of how the domain look like. So here, once we start the switching, first we form a small domain, then we form a big domain and we start to have a back switching. So back switching happens because of the surface charges we start to go down and the domain remains roughly the same. However, once we go in the negative regime, we actually suppress the back switching. So now the central small eyeball disappeared and if we start to go up, the domain form remains more or less invariant. So here we had the back switching because of the incomplete screening and here everything is fine. However, if we do the same experiment at 25% humidity rather than 0% humidity, the domain behavior becomes totally different. In this case, our back switching is very strong. Our domain patterns start to look like a donut and uh, the domain st shapes start to evolve during the negative and the second positive and second negative wave. So we start to have a very complex domain pattern that has the elements of the back switching and also formation of this uh, hexagonal shapes. In fact, if we do the studies in a more systematic way at the function of the number of cycles and the humidity, we start to see all kinds of crazy geometry. So from almost perfect switching at zero humidity to this complex uh, circular donut and the donut shape for the intermediate humidities and uh, multiple uh, domains for High humidity. So this is very interesting phenomenon, and uh, these results were published in this set of papers starting from uh, Nature Physics in 2014, and some of the applications 
of the domain switching towards alternative uh, mechanisms for data storage are discussed in the following publications. Now, for me, this particular work was very interesting because when I was an undergraduate student back in Moscow State in 92, uh, my advisor, Professor Tretikov, asked me to explore whether the solid-state chemical reactions can give rise to the chaotic behaviors. And after digging in the library for half a year, I came to the conclusion that uh, it is uh, not possible. And then uh, 20 years later, I sh have shown that actually chaotic behavior can appear in the solid state processes on the nanoscale. So that's a proverbial example of the master thesis, which was fulfilled uh, 20 years later after the task was set. Now, what about lateral switching? So this is the example of the experimental geometry when we use the PFM tip in order to switch polarization or observe polarization, but in addition to classical setup, we also have the lateral electrodes that we can also use to switch polarization. So these two electrodes are creating the in-plane field that can switch domains, and the tip can be used either to switch domains or to visualize domains, depending on what we want to do. And uh, in this case, the material orientation is chosen in such a way that the strontium ruthenate electrodes actually do the in-plane switching. So this is the example of how this approach works. So we start with the domain configuration like this. We apply bias uh, pulses of different lengths. We visualize the ferroelectric domains between the pulses. And you can start to see the beautiful textbook example of the ferroelectric domain switching. So we start with the almost uniform positive domains. So positive now means in-plane orientation and uh, some patterns of the negative domains. If we apply bias, you can see that how one domain formed the connection. So it grew very rapidly. If we keep increasing uh, time of the pulse, we start to nucleate new domains. And then all of a sudden, the large regions of the material start to switch and for sufficiently long pulse, we have almost complete in-plane switching. Now, it turns out that in this setup, we can actually explore the fundamental mechanism for the polarization switching. So this is the example of our reference point. In this case, we apply the 35 volt pulse for 10 microseconds, and we see the certain switching pattern. However, what we can also do is we can strain the electrode by applying a much larger negative bias pulse for 10 minutes, then switching polarization backward and try to repeat the switching for the same pulse parameters. And uh, if we do that, it turns out that this negative bias straining pumped sufficient amount of the negative charges into the electrode that allowed the negatively charged domain to nucleate much faster. So we essentially pump the charges in the system and that facilitates the nucleation in this given direction. At the same time, if we pump the positive charges in the system, that will impede nucleation. So for the same pulse parameters, same test pulse parameters, the switching behavior is totally different. Another example, and this is a very elegant experiment, where we use the PFM tip both to manipulate polarization and switch polarization. So here what we did was to create our domain polarization going in one direction, and then we use the tip in order to, uh, to uh, erase polarization, to create a negative domain. Now, if we induce switching, notice what happens. So we start to apply bias to the electrode, and we start to nucleate the negative domains over here. Interestingly, if we created the negative domain, somehow no more domain growth is observed. If we increase the time of the application to one millisecond or five millisecond, here we almost completely induce switching. And here, interestingly, the pre-existing negative domain suppresses the subsequent domain growth. So you know this very famous experiment that if you have a crack 
in your metallic part, very often you can arrest the crack growth by drilling the hole in the crack tip. So this uh, relaxes the strains and basically the crack propagation is arrested. So the same thing happens here. By negatively switching domain in this region, we suppressed the domain nucleation at the electrode. So at the electrode, it's very easy to nucleate the domain. At the wall between the positive and negative domains, it's very difficult to nucleate the domain. So once we drew this negative domain over here, we basically suppress the domain's nucleation and domain can no longer form. Uh, interestingly enough, if we write this negative domain along both electrodes, we really cannot switch the polarization anymore. So interestingly, by partially switching the material, we have precluded it from switching completely. So very interesting. And uh, these studies are discussed in detail in uh, this paper by Nina in collaboration with uh, Lane Martin, uh, Eddie Chu, and Ramesh. Now, the note of warning. So you may have noticed that over and over again, when I talk about the polarization switching, I always warn about the electrochemical effects. And the question is, how likely are those effects? So in the end, we are talking about the crystalline ferroelectric. Shouldn't they be stable? And the answer is no, they are not. So this is a very uh, beautiful paper by Werner Group when they created a uh, water electrolyte gated electrochemical device. So they have the source and drain. Uh, they have electrolyte, which is the potassium perchlorate in water. They have the gate. And uh, they apply a certain bias in order to gate this region. And what they do is they measure the conductivity of this region between the source and drain as the function of the gate bias during the gating stage and when the gate is off. And they measure the current. So both current, uh, uh, the Faraday current and the residual current in the system. And one thing they noticed is that once your bias on the gate electrode is relatively small, you see the changes in the conductance. This is just a field effect in the strontium titanate. However, you start to notice that almost from the very beginning, there is a relaxation component to this behavior. Once your gate bias becomes comparable to three and a half volts and higher, you can see that the time relaxation becomes extremely pronounced. More importantly, the system does not return to the ungated state. So this gating effect becomes uh, irreversible. And uh, in the same, uh, by the same token, the current through the gate becomes uh, pretty, pretty large and shows strong relaxation behavior. So they concluded that the reversible part of the process is just a classical gating mechanism, but the irreversible part suggests the onset of some electrochemical reaction in this region. And what's interesting is that if they take their sample out and look at it in the AFM, they observe that initially a flat surface developed bumps that were not there before. So you can say, okay, these bumps are a few nanometers, maybe it's not that large, but once they made the cross section of the sample, and looking at it in the electron microscope, they observe that there is a injection of the dislocation loops inside the material. This is really impressive because barely four volts applied in the aqueous solutions was enough to inject the dislocation loops inside the strontium titanate single crystal. Why is it relevant for PFM? Well, in PFM, we apply much higher biases and uh, we have enough water on the surface to create exactly the same situation. Of course, we cannot directly compare bias and PFM and bias and the electrochemical setup because in the PFM it is a two electrode setup. We have a huge IR drops in the system. So we don't know how much bias is dropped in the sample surface and how much bias is dropped in the, uh, throughout the material. However, the voltages are much higher and therefore these electrochemical effects are possible. 
So what would be the signature of this electrochemical behavior? And the answer is, is that once we have a topography change, that's a definite signature of the electrochemical response. So this is the PFM writing of the 20 nanometer lead titanate film. You can see that our tip have changed the topography of the sample. What's interesting is we can still see the pattern that we drew on the surface, but the change of topography suggests that it's not physics anymore, it's electrochemistry. Interestingly enough, sometimes it's possible to perform PFM writing on the film, which is nominally one unit cell, so it should not be ferroelectric, but it still looks like it's ferroelectric. And uh, at this point, we believe that this is a signature of so-called ferroionic states, and this is something that we are going to discuss in the, one of the future lectures. So the summary of the studies is given in these several papers, which discuss the role of electrochemical phenomena in SPM and uh, discuss the potential coupling between the physics and the electrochemical phenomena in solids. Now, in the end of this lecture, let me briefly mention the difference between the global and local dynamic. So as you learned in the introductory lecture, in the, we have two basic setups for the PFM, the top electrode. So we have bottom electrode, top electrode, and the tip, and the tip electrode, where the tip serves both as the sensor and the detector. So in the top electrode setup, the measurements are very robust and are insensitive to the tip state. So we apply bias, we switch polarization everywhere, but the tip detects the strain locally. So the resolution is limited by the film thickness or electrode thickness, but the nucleation happens where it wants to. So if we perform the switching, in this case, the domains form where they want and not where we want them to do. So in the tip electrode measurements, the excitation and the detection are local, so we concentrate our electric field locally and we perform the detection locally. Our resolution is limited by the tip radius or tip radius of curvature contact radius, and nucleation happens where we want it to. So generally, if we want to study polarization switching, most of the time we do it by the tip because here it happens where we want it to. However, if we study the ferroelectric capacitors, we can use the top electrode arrangement. And these are just few examples by the uh, Ruberman group when they explore the PFM and simultaneous switching current measurements and capacitors. And basically you apply the bias pulses to the top electrode and you can observe how the domain patterns evolve with time or with the length of the bias. And this is another example of the work from the Taiwan No group when they use this approach to collect the statistics of the nucleation bias in the lead titanate and basically delineate the, after repeating the experiment 100 times, determine the probability that nucleation will happen in each specific case. So this is the conclusion of this lecture and uh, thank you for your attention.